another uh, 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 key word was gas loss, and I'm going to jump over that until. Uh, oh, here it is. Okay. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the emphasis here is, and so I've uh, on these slides uh, listed uh, several things that might be relevant. Uh, one is uh, what is standard temperature and pressure, and as you know, that's uh, zero degrees centigrade and uh, 760 millimeters uh, of mercury. Uh, 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 Boyle's law uh, says that at a given temperature, the volume is uh, inversely proportional to pressure. Charles says that at a constant pressure, the volume is proportional to uh, absolute temperature. Gay-Lussac at a constant volume. Uh, the pressure is proportional to absolute temperature. And then there are various uh, combined laws. Uh, Dalton law, uh, very important, says that the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures, and we use that all the time. Uh, Graham's law refers to the rate of diffusion. Uh, Avogadro's hypothesis states that at a constant temperature and pressure, equal volumes of any gas has the same number of molecules, which is quite miraculous, and I don't understand why it happens. Uh, and, and finally, as you know, molar volumes uh, is uh, the, the volume of a, of a, of a gas uh, occupied by one mole, which is, uh, as you remember, perhaps from high school or whenever it was, uh, 22.3 liters. Um, so uh, turning uh, now to more uh, uh, practical things, uh, another key word was anesthesia ventilators. Again, I've probably uh, reviewed more than, than uh, is basic here. Uh, uh, some of the concepts are the classification of ventilators, uh, ascending versus descending bellows, uh, the uh, impact of changing fresh gas volume on delivered tidal volumes, uh, fresh gas decomp uh, 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 decoupling and uh, uh, detection of, of disconnection. So uh, ventilators can be uh, classified by the type of reservoir. Uh, uh, there are two uh, that we commonly use, bellows and piston, and a rare one called volume reflector, which I just mentioned for completeness, but uh, we don't use, and, and it's sort of confusing. Uh, another important uh, variable is the power source. Uh, in the old days, this was entirely compressed air. Uh, uh, more recently, uh, the power source has been electronic, but most of them now are a combination of both. Uh, uh, the, print, the implications are uh, uh, that uh, the ventilators may malfunction if you lose either uh, uh, source of gases or source of electricity. Uh, there are uh, uh, two commonly used drive mechanisms. One is pneumatic, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, and the other is mechanical, so-called single circuit. And then uh, there are the modes of uh, ventilation and cycling. And in the old days, this was very simple. It was just time. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are uh, virtually all types of modes that are available on ICU ventilators are available in OR ventilators. And finally, uh, uh, if uh, they employ bellows, they're classified rather descending or, or ascending. Uh, and I have a couple slides uh, uh, showing uh, the, uh, the two types of bellow ventilators and the piston ventilator, and here are some, some pictures of these uh, uh, three types. Uh, bellow ventilators are described as, as double circuit. Um, they're pneumatically driven, but uh, they may be controlled electronically. Uh, basically, it's a bellows inside a box, uh, which is the double circuit. Uh, inside the bellows is connected to the patient. The outside is to the uh, uh, source of, uh, of gas which drives the bellows. So the bellows is squeezed uh, down by the gas that's, uh, that's uh, inserted into the outside, uh, uh, which uh, presses the bellows down and squeezes the, the gas into the patient. Uh, the classification of ascending and descending 
uh, fundamental principle is what this term means. And what it refers to is the direction that the bellows moves during exhalation. <laughs> so uh, descending bellows uh, 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 are attached at the top of the box and uh, as during exhalation they descend. Uh, whereas ascending bellows are attached to the bottom of the box and uh, they rise uh, during expiration. Uh, in the old days, uh, we used uh, uh, descending bellow type ventilators, uh, but uh, most modern machines uh, use ascending bellows because they're considered safer. But uh, uh, there, there is a, a recurrence now of, of some descending bellows. Uh, uh, the, the reason ascending bellows are considered safer is because they won't fill uh, if you have a disconnect. And uh, if you have a leak, uh, they will progressively fill less and less. And finally, they won't entrain ambient air. Uh, conversely, the descending bellows uh, 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 will uh, 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 refill uh, even though you have a total disconnect. And uh, they can entrain air. Uh, the third variety, uh, or the other variety, main variety, is the piston ventilator, and uh, some of our modern machines use the piston ventilator. These are mechanically driven, uh, computer controlled, um, uh, with a motor. Uh, the advantage is that they don't use any, uh, they don't consume any gas, uh, and so uh, they're good if you lose uh, uh, sources of gas to your machine, and they provide very accurate uh, tidal volumes. Uh, the disadvantage, uh, from my viewpoint, is you can't see them, so you really don't know uh, exactly what's going on. Uh, um, uh, and uh, 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 secondly, they're silent, and uh, uh, but to overcome this, the machines put in an artificial noise, and you know that that respiratory sound you s you hear is is artificial; it, it, it's not real. But they put it in because uh, when we when they went to, to the piston, you you didn't hear anything. Um, uh, they there is one other problem, and that is, of course, they will refill if you have a total disconnect, uh, because uh, as long as they have access to the atmosphere, as they go into the refill phase, they'll they'll suck in what whatever is available. So in that regard, they have a little bit of the uh, same problems of the of the descending bellows. <coughs> And uh, if there's a leak, uh, they'll entrain air. Uh, <coughs> the uh, third variety, uh, which I put here only out of interest because it's in the book and I've never heard of it, uh, is called the volume reflector. And I don't want you to waste any time figuring out how it works. But, uh, but uh, uh, if it comes on the exam, uh, probably give it away and uh, come back another day. Um, uh, uh, another concept is what happens when you change fresh gas flow. Uh, this was more relevant in the past uh, because uh, uh, with the um, old type ventilators, uh, 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 during inspiration, uh, <coughs> the uh, well, let's let's go back. Normally, when you ventilate by hand. Uh, as beginners learn and, and you as experts uh, quickly learn, uh, you have to adjust the pop-off valve so you have enough uh, resistance so that you can inflate the lungs, but not so much so it overfills. So you're constantly, and when you're a beginner, you know that's a real problem. Either you can't ventilate the lungs or the, the bag distends, but quickly you learn how to do that. Well, when you're using a, a, a ventilator, uh, there's no little person inside there adjusting that pop-off valve. So what do they do? During inspiration, they close the circuit. And uh, uh, during inspiration, until the end of expiration, the circuit is closed. The implications of this is that any fresh gas flow that's being added to the circuit during inspiration is being added to the tidal volume delivered by the bellows. Therefore, uh, if you have high fresh gas flow, a lot of volume is being added uh, by the fresh gas flow, and if you have a little fresh gas flow, very little volume. The consequence is if you change the fresh gas flow, the tidal volume delivered by the ventilator 
uh, quote, the tidal volume being delivered to the patient will change even though the tidal volume delivered by the bellows itself is unchanged. And this used to be a problem. Well, uh, in recent years, uh, uh, the companies have, have overcome this. And the, the most common way to overcome this is by, monitor, by monitoring what the tidal volume is. And uh, as you know, there are monitors, inspiratory and expiratory flow monitors on your machines. And what they do is they monitor what is going to the patient. And it then adjusts the tidal volume of the ventilator so that what's being delivered to the, to the patient remains the same. However, this phenomenon is still there. And if you want to demonstrate it, uh, uh, if you suddenly change the fresh gas flow, uh, you'll notice that uh, in the first few breaths, uh, the tidal volume will change in the patient until the machine adjusts uh, what the tidal volume being delivered is. So if you suddenly decrease the fresh gas flow, the tidal volume will go down for a few breaths until the machine adjusts back up. And conversely, if you suddenly raise the fresh gas flow, the tidal volume will go way up for a few breaths until it adjusts. Um, so the phenomenon is still there, but the machine has, has corrected the problem. The other is a phenomenon called uh, fresh gas uh, decoupling. And that uh, was uh, developed by the Narcomed company. And basically what they do is during inspiration, they deflect the fresh gas flow away from the circuit. In fact, it goes into the bellows. And if you carefully watch your machine, you'll notice that during inspiration, the bellows expand. Why does the bellow expand? That's because the fresh gas flow is going into the, bellow, in, into, the, into the bag. I may have said bellows, I meant the bag. So during inspiration, the bag will gradually expand because the fresh gas flow is being uh, uh, diverted uh, there. And then during expiration, it, it goes back uh, into the system. And that's called decoupling. Now, uh, finally, <coughs> the actual tidal volume delivered to the patient uh, uh, is not always exactly what, what the ventilator is, is sending uh, uh, into the circuit for two reasons. Uh, one is there's a compression of gases. Uh, the second is there's compliance of the tubing. Uh, now, our tubing is fairly stiff, so, so there's not too much discrepancy. And then, of course, there's the final problem of a leak, which could could screw things up. Another key word is uh, safety systems or alarms. Uh, and uh, there are uh, a number of kinds of alarms we have. Uh, there are apnea alarms, disconnect alarms, uh, uh, inspired oxygen alarms. Uh, what's important is that they need to be activated. And uh, the, uh, the default on our machines now is to have the alarms turned off which when you work with me, you know I complain what that red light means. Um, they should be on. You all tell me, well, I'm always watching. Well, I know you're always watching except when you aren't. Not because you're inattentive, because something directs your attention somewhere else. So I think it's important that they're active. A second important thing is that, that the alarm should be uh, set at a sensitive range. Uh, a lot of the default alarms are very low level. Like the default for FiO2 is, is 20%. Well, yeah, it, uh, that's the lower limit. You don't ever want it below 20. But if you're running 90% auction, the auction should never below 85. And, and if something happens and it gradually falls, you ought to find out early until you're at the, at the basement before you find out. Uh, the, the same is true of uh, agent monitoring, etc. So set the alarms close to where you ought to be running. And then there's a, the, the issue of, of how that information is transmitted. Is it by lights? Is it by messages? Is it by sound? Uh, we have a, a number of uh, safety devices. Uh, one is the auction fail safe. Um, uh, and uh, as, as you know, uh, uh, we mentioned yesterday, uh, there's a, a, a fail-safe device here that when the oxygen pressure in the circuit is, is uh, below uh, about, uh, uh, I think, 30 uh, PSI, 
uh, it will uh, turn off uh, all the other gases. Uh, and uh, 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 so uh, uh, if you happen, and this was more in the era when we commonly use nitrous, um, if the oxygen goes down, uh, it'll turn the nitrous off so, so you can't uh, deliver uh, uh, pure nitrous. Uh, but this only measures the pressure. And as long as the pressure is all right, uh, you could dial in a hypoxic mixture. So, so uh, then they uh, developed the uh, uh, oxygen nitrous oxide proportioning system so that uh, uh, you couldn't uh, uh, dial in a, a hypoxic mixture. And uh, there are two systems, the uh, Omega system use this uh, chain link system and uh, North American Drager used a, a pressure monitoring system uh, to uh, so that you you uh, can't dial in uh, a hypoxic mixture if you're using nitrous again a lot of this related to the era when we use a lot of nitrous we tend not to use so much uh, nowadays uh, the final protection which I didn't put a slide in here is the fact that it's now required, as you know, uh, that our machines have a oxygen monitor, uh, 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 dedicated oxygen monitor, independent of all the other uh, airway gas monitors that detect, that monitors the oxygen content leaving the anesthesia machine. Because if either of these other two uh, safety devices fail, uh, the final safety device is to monitor the, the oxygen saturation going into the patient. Uh, from the machine. Some other uh, uh, devices are, are the, uh, the uh, DIS and the PIS. Uh, the uh, DIS is the diameter index safety system. Uh, this uh, reflects to the uh, lines that come from the wall to the, to the machine. And the uh, PIN index safety system, which refers to uh, the system that uh, uh, relates to the uh, cylinders. Uh, this shows the uh, uh, pin index safety system and basically it uh, consists of uh, two components. Uh, on, on the uh, uh, anesthesia machine uh, at the yoke there are these two uh, prongs that stick out uh, and uh, on the tanks uh, there are holes in the tanks uh, and so the the holes in the tanks have to match the pins, position of the pins, so you can't put the wrong tank uh, onto the yoke. Uh, this is easily defeated if these pins are knocked off, either uh, by some uh, uh, bad person or, or by accident, and, and that has happened. So, so, so nothing is, 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 uh, is free. Uh, uh, the other is this uh, diameter index system, and uh, this refers to the uh, type of connectors on the end of these uh, of these uh, uh, lines that come from the wall. And uh, when they go into the machine, into the anesthesia machine, uh, they have to, to to match up. Again, it could be defeated if someone put the wrong kind of connector on 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 the tubing. Uh, we have a number of low pressure alarms, uh, uh, pipeline pressure, tank pressure, airway pressure, which we uh, talked about, all, all of these we talked about uh, yesterday. And uh, then uh, there's the problem of leaks and disconnect. There are many different locations on the machine where you can have leaks. Uh, there can be uh, uh, in the high pressure circuit, which relates to the wall sources and the cylinders, uh, the flow meters, uh, the circle uh, where you connect to the patient and uh, of course uh, uh, the, in the endotracheal tube uh, and, uh, and in the patient. Another key word is a scavenger system. Uh, um, scavenging is advocated, uh, required, and practiced uh, because of the unproven <laughs> concern about exposure to low concentration of inhaled uh, anesthetic gases uh, as a health hazard. And uh, these are the guidelines uh, I've taken, uh, in this case, I think, from, from Barish. And this is the maximum uh, concentration that's allowed in the environment 
with these various agents. Where did this come from? Out of the head of gray-haired people. No data. But these are the rules we have to follow. So, so and we have a big industry. I, I, you may notice uh, periodically technicians come in uh, once a month and with these sniffer machines and sniff around and make sure that so that we can tell Jayco uh, that that we follow these rules. Uh, a little bit like not wearing your mask uh, around the halls and other ridiculous rules, but those are the rules we have. Uh, you know, it, it's probably a good idea, but uh, but uh, again, there's there's little evidence that that these gases, in fact, uh, do bad things to people. Um, conversely, there are lots of ways that that we can uh, uh, leak gases. Uh, in, into the environment, uh, the pop-off valve, the ventilator, uh, gas sampling, um, uh, 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 leaks, uh, uh, mass, uh, non-cuffed endotracheal tubes, and when you fill the vaporizer. Uh, now there tend to be closed systems, so the, the leak at that time is, is very minimal, but in the past, when we poured it in, uh, that, that was a p potential problem. Um, now, uh, there, uh, the scavenger system, there are several varieties. One is active, and in other words, uh, they're, they're connected to suction or vacuum. Others are passive. They just uh, are open to the outside atmosphere. Uh, they can be either closed or open system. Uh, if they're closed, they need uh, to have uh, pop-off valves that prevent excessive positive or negative pressure. Uh, and uh, and uh, 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 all of this can be improved again by having good uh, 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 air exchange uh, in the in the, in in the in the ORs. Uh, this is just from one of the texts, which uh, uh, shows uh, one of the scavenger uh, systems. It, it's interesting. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't know uh, where does this all go. It goes uh, hopefully out in the air. Uh, so the rest of our community can can share the gases that we don't want in a, in our ORs. Uh, there are reports that sometimes these actually go down in the mechanical section of the hospital rather than to the environment. Uh, this just shows some of the complexity of these uh, the scavenging systems uh, with the pop-off valves to prevent excessive positive pressure and excessive negative pressure. And uh, uh, because uh, if, if they aren't working properly, they can cause leaks in the circuit, they can cause buildup of pressures and, and other, other, other problems. Now, another uh, uh, key word is uh, something that uh, always confuses me. I have to read uh, each, each time about it. And uh, one is uh, the line isolation monitor. Uh, uh, Barish's uh, uh, textbook has a has a really nice uh, discussion uh, of this. Uh, uh, what uh, the line isolation monitor refers to is the fact that uh, in in many operating rooms uh, the power uh, is is uh, ungrounded. Um, uh, the the advantage of this is that uh, uh, if it's ungrounded, it means that. Uh, if uh, you touch a piece of equipment and, um, and um, uh, you're standing in water which somehow is connected ground, there'll be no circuit because uh, the, the equipment uh, uh, is not uh, connected to ground. And uh, this prevents uh, a macro shock. Now, to, to make sure that, uh, that uh, the system is adequately grounded, uh, these line isolation monitors uh, monitor how uh, how uh, intact this uh, disconnect from ground is, uh, and uh, when they uh, 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 when the alarm sounds, it uh, in implies that uh, there's been uh, uh, a loss of, of this uh, 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 ungrounding. Um, equipment will still work, uh, and. Uh, and uh, although uh, macro shock is, is unlikely, uh, micro shock is, is still possible. And we're going to talk about that in, in a second. Uh, 
Uh, however, if uh, the line isolation monitor alarms, uh, you should then uh, uh, have someone investigate the various pieces of equipment and see which is uh, the de defective equipment and, and get rid of it. Um, another source of the alarm, however, if, is if you have uh, 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 many different pieces of, of equipment uh, uh, in operation, each of them may have a tiny leak uh, but altogether, they're enough to 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 uh, sound sound the alarm. Now, uh, uh, the advantage of, of line isolation is it prevents uh, micro shock, uh, but it doesn't prevent micro shock. Uh, uh, and micro shock shock refers to the fact that if you have a connection uh, directly inside the body. Uh, by uh, catheters or wires, uh, 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 pulmonary artery catheters, uh, pacemaking wires, uh, uh, pacing wires, uh, that uh, it takes uh, about one hundredth as much current to cause fibrillation as it would uh, if you uh, 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 touch the patient uh, on their skin. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the line isolation monitor does not protect patients uh, from uh, the risk of micro shock. And therefore, at the bottom here, I've summarized some of the things you can do to minimize uh, uh, that uh, uh, risk of micro shock. One is uh, to make sure that the uh, 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 ground wire of the equipment is connected. That's the third prong uh, uh, that. Uh, um, None of the equipment touches the patient or any electrical equipment. Uh, wearing of rubber gloves, uh, proper maintenance, uh, and electrically isolating all uh, direct patient connections uh, from a uh, power source, uh, like ECG monitors uh, and uh, uh, transducers and others. And uh, unbeknownst to you, probably is that all of our EKG machines and and uh, pressure monitors and pacemakers are in fact uh, isolated uh, from from ground to, to minimize this this risk. Another uh, uh, key word was uh, was uh, turbulent flow. As you know, there are two types of flow. One is laminar. One is turbulent. Uh, laminar is is smooth and orderly, uh, and uh, follows uh, uh, Hagen Ploeg cells law. And uh, there is a direct relationship between flow and pressure. Uh, turbulent flow, on the other hand, is disorderly. Um, uh, particles move in all sorts of directions. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hagen Poiseuille law does not apply uh, in that, uh, uh, in two ways. First of all, it, it, uh, resistance is related to the fifth power of radius, not the fourth power of radius. And secondly, uh, uh, resistance is related to density um, as well as uh, viscosity. And uh, this is the formula. And unlike uh, uh, laminar flow in which pressure gradient is uh, linear to, uh, to uh, 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 flow, uh, with, uh, uh, with turbulent flow is exponential and, and it rises faster and faster uh, uh, the, 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 the greater the flow. Um, uh, uh, turbulent flow can be generalized uh, or uh, localized. Uh, uh, localized occurs at uh, points of sudden change in, in diameter, uh, angles, uh, uh, irregular surfaces, um, orifices, uh, and uh, uh, those uh, need to be avoided whenever possible in the circuits. Um, you can also get a turbulent flow uh, in, in, in pipes uh, when uh, the velocity I exceeds a, a critical value. And uh, this is predicted by what's called Reynolds number. And this is a formula uh, which uh, you're not going to uh, memorize, but just the concept. And in general, uh, when uh, that number is less than uh, 2,000, uh, the flow is usually laminar. When it's uh, over 4,000, 
uh, it's usually turbulent. Uh, this brings up uh, the topic of, of heliox. heliox. Um, um, it's typically supplied in E cylinders, usually 30% oxygen and 70% helium, but some also are 20% uh, oxygen and 80% helium. Uh, uh, remember that unlike laminar flow, uh, 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 which is uh, uh, related to viscosity, turbulent flow is related to density. Uh, and herein lies the benefit of, of helium, because although the uh, viscosity is similar to air, the density is about one-seventh uh, the, the density of, of air. And therefore, if you have a, a turbulent flow, such as with Strider or severe asthma, uh, you can uh, markedly uh, improve the characteristics by giving uh, uh, heliox. Uh, another uh, key word was uh, the concept of volume responsiveness and, and its measurement. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I have a number of uh, things on Wiki uh, related to this and provided you some, uh, some uh, references that I just uh, skipped over. Uh, but uh, the concept of fluid responsiveness is uh, will a patient respond favorably uh, with the administration of fluid. Uh, uh, and how one defines this uh, 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 favorable response uh, depends uh, on, uh, on the investigator. Uh, it could be their clinical appearance, their heart rate, their arterial pressure, cardiac output, and, and what have you. Uh, uh, but uh, the conventional definition of uh, fluid responsiveness is an increase in cardiac output in response to the rapid infusion of, of, a, of a fluid challenge. Uh, having said this, uh, there are a lot of variables that, that uh, in various studies. Uh, the first is uh, how much increase in cardiac output is considered a positive response. And it varies anywhere from five to 20%, typically five, uh, 10 to 15, but not, not consistently. Another issue is, uh, so uh, you're going to base it on cardiac output, how are you going to measure cardiac output? And this can be uh, uh, non-invasively or with a pulmonary artery catheter or echo or something like that. Uh, the other sets of variables is the fluid challenge. Uh, how much, how fast, what fluid? So, uh, uh, you know, there's no single answer to all of this because uh, each study has, has used different parameters. Uh, now, uh, I have some reservations about this concept uh, 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 be, because uh, uh, being fluid responsive uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the patient is hypovolemic or that the patient needs an increase in cardiac output. I suspect that every, every one of you, if we lay you down and measure your cardiac output and then gave you a fluid bolus, that your cardiac output would go up. Does that mean you need to have more fluid, that you need to have a higher cardiac output? Not necessarily. So uh, in, it, it's my belief that the first point you should ask is does the patient have a problem which might be related to fluid deficiency, uh, which therefore might be helped by giving fluid? Not to first say, the, does the patient respond to fluid? And, and I think uh, a lot of people are are, are treating, quote, the concept of fluid responsiveness rather than the concept of do they need any intervention at all? Well, getting back to the fundamental thing, how do you predict fluid responsiveness? And uh, traditionally, we use static measures like CVP or uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressure. Uh, uh, but uh, these have been found to, to not be uh, very reliable predictors of fluid responsiveness. And uh, so now uh, dynamic uh, indices have, have been used. Uh, uh, early on, it was the response of filling pressures to f for a fluid bolus. So you gave a fluid bolus. If the filling pressure went way up, uh, you said, well, they probably are overloaded. You don't need to give more. If the, fluid per if the filling pressures hardly went up at all, or they went up briefly and then went right back down, you, you, you said that, uh, well, probably they, they were fluid responsive. But um, 
more uh, uh, recently, uh, the uh, uh, use of uh, the impact of positive pressure ventilation on uh, arterial uh, pressure has become a very popular way of estimating uh, uh, fluid responsiveness. Uh, as you know, when you give positive pressure uh, ventilation, uh, uh, or conversely, when the patient's breathing spontaneously, there's a slight variability uh, in, 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 the, in the blood pressure. And this is because uh, 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 the stroke volume varies uh, with, with uh, respiration, with positive pressure ventilation. Uh, with positive pressure, uh, there's an interference with uh, cardiac uh, return, and so the pressure goes down. And then with expiration, uh, the uh, venous return increases and, and blood pressure goes up. And uh, uh, so this is a normal response. And uh, the, the variability in, in pulse pressure or, uh, or systolic pressure or stroke volume uh, in response to ventilation uh, can be estimated as uh, the maximum uh, uh, minus the minimum divided by the mean. And that multiplied by 100 gives you a percent. Uh, normally, uh, this variability uh, is uh, around 5%. However, it's been uh, observed for years and years, but in the last 15 years, it's been quantitated that when this variability uh, increases uh, uh, above some number, and that's part of the problem, there's no agreement about what that number is, but it's somewhere around uh, between 8 and 15%. Uh, the higher, the more predictive it is that when this variability increases, it suggests that the patient will be fluid responsive. And this has become uh, commonly used uh, to uh, judge whether a patient is going to respond to a, to a, to a volumes uh, uh, challenge. Um, uh, and and uh, this has uh, become very popular. However, there are some important limitations to using this parameter. One is that it's limited to intubated patients on controlled ventilation without any spontaneous breathing. Uh, they have to have a regular cardiac rhythm. They must need to have a good arterial waveform. Uh, it's influenced by uh, the, the pattern of ventilation. Specifically, the tidal volume has to be over eight uh, milliliters per kilo per minute. Nowadays, we tend to use less than that. It's influenced by lung function. It's influenced by the presence of ARDS or, or pulmonary hypertension. Uh, uh, it's probably influenced by patient's position and abdominal distension. Uh, uh, reliability in children uh, is, and pregnancy is, is unproven. And, and finally, uh, what's bothersome to me is, is the difference between a positive and negative value is relatively small. In other words, the, the difference between 8% uh, and 12%, uh, pretty, pretty modest in, in a biologic uh, 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 system. And, and finally, it's now known there's really a, a, a wide gray zone, somewhere between maybe 8 and 12% and, and, and uh, where uh, it's no better than a toss of a coin. So although this is very popular, uh, it has uh, serious limitations. And, um, and uh, um, uh, so although I use it, and I think you should use it, uh, uh, you need to be cognizant of, of, its, of its limitations. Uh, I have a whole lot more about this and about so-called goal-directed fluid therapy. Uh, I see that I'm out of time, so I'm just going to alert you to what is on the slides. Uh, uh, a key word was Doppler principle. I've uh, uh, discussed uh, uh, what this is. Uh, one of the questions is what is the impact of the uh, difference between the angle of uh, the uh, uh, ultrasound and the, the flow rate? and uh, the larger the angle is, the less accurate this is. 
and in general when the angle exceeds about 20 percent it, it becomes uh, 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 erroneous uh, another uh, uh, I think key question was what is the influence of, of frequency um, uh, the higher the frequency the more uh, uh, accurate is the image uh, however the higher the frequency uh, the less penetration you get so uh, you'd like to have a high frequency and uh, uh, but uh, uh, to get a, a clear image but the deeper you go uh, you you don't get any image so for for uh, very superficial things like uh, uh, looking at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at the wrist, etc., uh, you can use high frequency, 15 to 20 uh, 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 megahertz. Uh, whereas uh, when you're doing uh, trans thoracic echo and you're looking at 12 centimeter distances, you may have to go down to frequencies of three. So, so that's in, in, in there. I've also indicated other ways we use the Doppler principle. Another uh, uh, key word was, and I didn't put the, the number here, was radiation exposure. And I've, uh, I've uh, uh, summarized some of the radiation risks. We're being exposed to more and more with interventive procedures, uh, which often are long and involved a lot. You really have to be uh, concerned. And uh, the, the, the three components of this protection uh, uh, is, uh, is barriers, uh, uh, shielding, uh, minimizing exposure time and distance and uh, the important concept here is that uh, that uh, the uh, intensity of radiation is inversely proportional to the distance squared um, uh, the other important concept is that the the radiation exposure we get generally is not directly from the x-ray machine but it's from scattering uh, off of the patient in the table so it's not staying away from where that machine is, it's staying away from the patient. And uh, generally, uh, at least three feet is recommended. And it turns out that if you're six feet away, this is equivalent to nine uh, uh, inches of concrete or two and a half millimeters of lead, which is what's, what's in the, the, the lead aprons. Uh, and uh, I just realized I, I left off an important thing. You probably should use, especially if you're doing a lot of these uh, badges to, to keep track of what's going on. Awareness and equipment issues. Uh, and uh, 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 there's no particular text on this. Uh, 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 and, and so this is just off the top of my head. Uh, but uh, uh, I divide it into inhalation anesthesia and TIVA. Uh, for inhalation anesthesia, if you have uh, leaks, if you have entrainment of air, and if you have uh, problems with your with your vaporizer, all of these can, of course, uh, lead to to uh, inadequate uh, uh, inhalation agents and thus awareness. As far as TIVA, uh, if you're not delivering the drug uh, to the patient because it's the wrong drug, uh, the, the uh, pump has been uh, uh, not uh, programmed properly, the pump isn't working, you have a disconnect or you have infiltration and we've, we've reported such cases in our case discussion conference. Not, I don't think, for awareness but certainly for failure of inotropic drugs to work in, in, in patients. So uh, how do we detect it? Uh, two ways, agent monitoring, if you're talking about inhalation agents, and depth of anesthesia monitoring, uh, such, as, such as BIT. And how do we prevent it? Uh, Pre-op machine checkout, uh, vigilance, and, and monitoring. Uh, there's also talk about MRI. You guys are more experts than I. Uh, as I read about it, it's really complicated. Um, I've given you some, some references, and I think the bottom line is uh, we really need to go to the experts. That's the technicians in the MRI, the radiologists in the MRI. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of controversy about different pieces of equipment. Are they ferromagnetic or not? The good news is that more and more of the devices they're putting into patients are no longer ferromagnetic, but who knows which one and so it, it really takes a, a, a survey and sometimes calling the manufacturer to see what the problem is I've, I've, I have a number of slides on this uh, and the issue of pacemakers and, and defibrillators comes up all the time and I've given you some some reference to that and finally burns 
and the problem is that MRI can induce currents into wires and these can then burden the patients. And that's it and thank you very much for staying an extra few minutes and I'll post all of this on Wiki. Thank you, sir.